Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we open the book of Zephaniah again and look at the words to understand the words and eat the words that our Heavenly Father has presented for us, shall we not praise him for the time that we currently have to come to an understanding of that which he would have us to know? Shall we also not take this in so that we may more fully understand that which he would have us to do at this time? Shall we now seek his word and seek for his wisdom in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, We see the times in which we live. We understand, Father, that which is occurring all around us. But yet our, our minds need to be opened further. We know that you are Lord. We know that you are choosing to lead those that will be led of you. Help us now to understand the words of this prophet and that which you have provided for us and for our admonition. We ask for your guidance, but we also ask <clears throat> that your angels may attend us. May we come to an understanding together of that which you would have us to know. We ask that your spirit is with us as well. Because it is only through your spirit that we may come to an understanding of what true righteousness is. And so that by faith, together, we may be blessed and may understand that which you would have us to know. Direct us this day. Be with us each one attending this meeting. And for those that will view this later. For this father we ask. For this we pray. In Jesus name. Amen. Now, as a bit of a recap, we turn back to Zephaniah 3, verse 8. Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them my indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured in the fire of my jealousy. We are told to wait upon the Lord. We are given this also from the book of Psalms. We are told to wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord, along with wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. And then we have Proverbs twenty twenty two, which we read last week. Say not thou, I will recompense evil, but wait on the Lord, and he shall save thee. Now, For then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. 
from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughter of my dispersed, shall bring mine offering. In that day shalt thou not be ashamed for all thy doings, wherein thou hast transgressed against me. For then I will take away out of the midst of thee them that re rejoice in their pride. And thou shalt no more be haughty in my holy mountain, or because of my holy mountain. Are we to be of a prideful or haughty spirit? Are we to be those that would seek our way first? Or are we to follow the Lord? What are we being told here to do? I will also leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and a poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. I think it's very clear. We are to be trusting in God. We are to be trusting that he knows better than we know that which we need. Now, as we look further, we are told from the book of Jeremiah, trust ye not in lying words, saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. Do we find salvation within the church? Do we find salvation in any church. Where is our salvation and how do we find it? Is our salvation not in Christ alone? Amen. From Micah, the heads thereof judge for reward, and the preach, <clears throat> and the priests thereof teach for hire, and the prophets thereof divine for money. Yet they lean, yet will they lean upon the Lord and say, "Is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us." And Matthew three verse nine, and think not to say within yourselves, "We have Abraham to our father." For I say unto you that God is able <clears throat> of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Many times over the last several years, it has been being said to me directly <clears throat> that salvation is only within the church. If salvation is only within the church, then so is our righteousness. <clears throat> if our righteousness is within the church, then why has Christ not come? Yeah, I mean, this is a pretty problematic thing that I've found in Adventism that didn't used to exist at least not amongst conservatives. Um, but I've heard many conservatives say that if you lose your membership in the church, you lose salvation. If you're disfellowshipped, basically, much like the Catholic Church, you're cut off from Christ. Brothers, 
Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. I was just going to say that, you know, I haven't heard it so much blatantly put that way, but I've heard it implied so heavily that, <laughs> you know, you wouldn't even, you wouldn't even question it unless you knew there was a difference. Well, when I, when I was baptized 40 years ago, um, you know, it was pretty clear that the membership to the church was not salvational, that this was something just to be a part of the body of Christ, to be active in the church, that my salvation was not based upon church membership, that in a sense, church membership was more a formality. It was my connection being baptized into Christ. That's the way it was understood 40 years ago. But that's definitely changed now. Um, that would have been the same for uh, me as well. Since 2001, I have had the opportunity to have been in a multitude of various Adventist churches. What I find most interesting is the attitude that is being expressed currently. That if your membership is not in good standing, if you are not a member of the Seventh Adventist Church, you have no salvation. Earlier this week, I had the opportunity of having a conversation that went on for almost four hours, and the majority of that was a Bible study. One of the comments had come back asking me, are you an Adventist? And as I have answered many times, I am an Adventist in that I believe in the soon coming of Christ. Am I a Seventh-day Adventist? Do I understand the Seventh-day Sabbath and its importance? But I am yet more of a Millerite Adventist in that I understand the validity and the necessity of prophecy. If we are not willing to look upon the gospel as a three-step prophetic testing message, if our attitude is that all we need is Jesus, nothing else matters, then how can we give the message that needs to go to this world at this time? What shall one then answer the messengers of the nation that the Lord hath founded Zion and that the poor of his people shall trust in it? Zechariah 11, 11. And it was broken in that day so that the poor of the flock that waited upon me knew that it was the word of the Lord. When we have seen doublings, when we have seen words repeated within verses, we've come to the understanding that these doublings are pointing to the second angel's message. And it was broken in that day so that the poor of the flock that waited upon me knew that it was the word of the Lord. How many of us today understand and are willing to accept the plain word of the Lord. Did Christ not say, other sheep in other folds have I? If that is the case, are those other sheep also not those that will find salvation through Christ and through Christ alone? Matthew 5, 3, 
Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Not always do we find that those that are the lauded, the ones that are held up as being wonderful teachers, are going to be those that will be able to give a message such as this. Do they want to give a message that is difficult? Do they want to give a message that points only to Christ? Or are they more interested in giving a message that lifts them up? But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. And base things of the world and things that are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. And then James 2.5. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which hath promised to them that love him? <clears throat> the poor of the world may not be lifted up by churches, unions, conferences, but they are the rich in faith. Were the disciples among those that were held up as the important people to listen to during the time that Christ walked on the earth? No, no. Was Christ accepted as the Son of God during his time on earth? Will those that bring this message be of any greater stature than was Christ or the disciples? What identified them more directly? To those of the Jewish church after Pentecost. What did they see in these fishermen, of these tax collectors, of these zealots, of these students of scripture? <clears throat> what was the one overriding thing that they saw in all of these disciples? I think it was the lack of education. Well, I was thinking more that they saw their unity. Is that it? They, yeah. They knew that these men were not educated in the schools that they had set up. They were not the ones that had been accepted in these schools to be taught. But were they not unified in their message? Well, yeah. They were. Being unified. They're known for the, sorry, ahead. Dwight. They're known for the boldness, too. And I believe that that boldness was because of the spirit upon them, within them. Because they were so sure of what they were preaching. They were founded on it. But if they were sure upon what they were preaching, what does that indicate to you? They had truly learned of Christ, not only mentally, but character-wise. Does that also not mean that they had faith? Amen. Oh, 
the remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity. Uh, or, yes, please. The other thing was that they had a common theme. They had all walked with the Lord and he had helped them understand what he, he was there for and what he wanted them to do. And that commonality, I think, also is part of that, you, you know, uh, feature that you were talking about where everybody is in unity. Here we have an example. <clears throat> we have those that walked with the Lord that learned of him for over three and a half years. But yet we have an example also within Acts of one who walked not with the Lord for those three and a half years, who is the example for us of the other sheep of other folds. And who am I referring to? Um, was that guy that was prophesizing that uh, Apollos and uh, his wife straightened out? Talked with him for a while, gave him a more, clearer understanding because he was he was going along doing just that. He was talking about Christ and uh, these things, but he he wasn't a part of their actual group. I thought you were talking about Saul or change to Paul. That's who I was speaking of. Because where where was? Saul, who became Paul, where was he throughout this this time with Christ? Was he not being accepted within the leadership of the church as being one of them? Well, yeah. Was he, he, he was not, a Pharisee, wasn't he? Of course. Did he not identify himself as a Jew among Jews? Yeah. He was of the tribe of what? Benjamin? He was taught by Gamaliel. He understood the law. And he was sent by the church in Jerusalem to destroy those that he found that had walked with Christ. And yet, what happened with him? Conversion. His experience on the road to Emmaus. Excuse me, not Emmaus. His experience coming toward those that he would destroy. He was given the vision of Christ and had to learn on his own for a period in order to give his testimony. Here again, the remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies, neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Does not this verse give us hope that in unity, in truly understanding that which Christ would have us to know, that Christ would have us to experience, that we will receive from him that which we need, and that when we do seek rest, None shall make us afraid. Is this not a promise to us at this day? Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem.
within the spirit of prophecy, we come to this. Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. For then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughters of my dispersed, shall bring mine offering. In that day shalt thou not be ashamed for all thy doings, wherein thou hast transgressed against me. For then I will take away out of the midst of thee them that rejoice in thy pride. For thou shalt no more be haughty because of my holy mountain. I will also leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies. Neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. In this our time, some whose tongues are deceitful have been representing many things that they themselves have formed and testified to, as if the law of truth were in their heart and coming from their lips. But the Lord will surely punish every deceitful lying tongue that has caused his people to err and to turn to the righteousness and to turn from the righteousness of Christ. Righteousness by faith. Does that imply righteousness within a church no no we have righteousness in christ alone it is a gift that is being freely offered but it is a gift that many are rejecting This is the choice that we are being given. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He hath cast out thine enemy, the king of Israel, even the Lord is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil any more. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion, let not thy hands be slack. Why is there a separation here between Jerusalem and Zion? What symbols are being presented? Is one, can one not be shown to be, as we would say, the movement? And can one not be shown to be the people? Those that will come, those that will help to give this message. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. Again, the Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. Who will save? He will save. Does it say here? that we are saved by faith in a general conference president. Does it say here that we, were, we would be saved by faith in a pastor? 
are we saved in any other save Christ? He will joy over thee with singing. I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly who are of thee, to whom the reproach of it was a burden. Behold, at that time, I will undo all that afflict thee, and I will save her that hate halteth, and gather her that was driven out. I will give get them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. At that time, I will bring you again, even in the time that I gather you. For I will make you a name and a praise among all the people of the earth. When I turn back your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord. Since July 18th, there have been many that view that this message has been incorrect. But I say to you from the words of this prophet. This is our heavenly father. He is testing and proving those that would give a message. The promise that is being offered here. That he will gather. He will make those a name and a praise among all the people of the earth. He will turn back the captivity, the shame, the issue that many have abandoned. And he will do this before our eyes. I have instruction to give from the Lord. The condition of things in Battle Creek is to be clearly marked out and understood. Those who have brought about this condition are sadly deceived. But the Lord will be glorified. All those who have taken counsel of God will walk very humbly before him. In no case are they to be diverted from the light that God has given to his people. They are not to believe falsehoods. They are not to believe published lies. Spiritual transformations are to take place. We have before us situations that we are seeing within the church and within the movement. The church, since 2001, has been choosing to accept the teachings of the Jesuits. They wish that spiritual formation, as it is taught by the cruelest of the papists' servants, would be inundated throughout the Adventist church. This is a spiritual transformation of an opposite type of what's being referred to here. This is a choice. The choice that is being presented because within the messages of Revelation 14, we are told to fear God, to give glory to him, and to understand that the hour of his judgment has come. We have a choice. Are we willing to be judged of God, or are we wanting to be judged of man. Are we willing to accept the robe that Christ has offered 
or do we wish to accept the accolades of the world? A voice is to be heard in the tabernacle giving the word of God in clear notes of warning for this time. How much more clear is it than fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Do we have any disagreement with that admonition that we find in the 14th chapter of Revelation? <clears throat> God has his human instrumentalities that shall not hold their peace. May this be said of us, brothers and sisters. They are to advocate the word and work and way of the Lord to be accomplished through his human instrumentalities. In a clear, decided manner, they are to proclaim the truth in distinct lines. None of the dangerous sophistries devised by Satan are to be introduced, for these lead to skepticism and the, of the fundamental truths that the Lord has substantiated by many miraculous evidences during the past half century. And this was written in 1906. So what is she referring to? that began in 1856. What miraculous evidences have been provided? What about the articles of Hiram Medicine? We have many blessings that have come from different things that were written by the true pioneers, not the pioneers falsely so-called. A voice is to be heard in clear affirmation of the truth in contradistinction to the skepticism and fallacies that have been coming in from the enemy of truth, spiritual transformations will take place, and the working out of the principle of divine truth will reveal the change of character. For the divine agencies are efficient to address the human understanding. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth. <clears throat> but God that giveth the increase. 1 Corinthians 3, 7. Oh, let us win souls to Christ. Let us labor as those who have experienced the virtue of truth as it is in Jesus. Are we to be skeptics of these truths that were presented by the pioneers. No. What are no. we what are we to do with these truths? Are we not to accept them, study them, and proclaim them as Christ would have us to do? Uh, yes. There is to be at this period a series of events which will reveal that God is the master of the situation. The truth will be proclaimed in clear, unmistakable language. Those who preach the truth will strive to demonstrate the truth by a well-ordered life and godly conversation. And as they do this, they will become powerful in advocating the truth and in giving it the sure application 
that God has given it. Did we find that those that have followed Parminder and Tess have become skeptics of the word of God and the word of his prophet? Have we not seen that they have chosen to walk a different path, that in setting aside the spirit of prophecy, they are also setting aside the clear word of the Bible? Is this to be what we are to be doing? Are we to become skeptics, falling for every possible different thought that might be presented? Or are we to hold on to the word that we find to be guided by this word that is true? In Daniel 8, we have to go to the very end of the chapter where we are told that this vision of the Arab and Boker, the vision of the evening morning, is true. This vision is also an experience for us today. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He hath cast out thine enemy, the king of Israel. Even the Lord is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil any more. What's being described with this? If the Lord has taken away thy judgments. What is being seen if he has cast out thine enemy? Is this, if he has taken away thy judgments, not the close of the Day of Atonement? Where he's taken away judgments and he's cast out the enemy? Is this not the close of that great day? In that day, I shall say to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion, let not thine hands be faint. The Lord thy God is in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save, he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love, or as the alternate would say, he will be silent in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Now, as we look, some of the things that the translators had used in support of these verses would bring us back to earlier portions in Zephaniah 3, which we had been reading, but also in Ezekiel. It was round about 18,000 measures, and the name of the city from that day shall be, The Lord is There. Jerusalem in covenant would be changed in name to being the Lord is there. We also have Revelation 7, 15 and 21, 3. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. 
Revelation 23 and 4. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, and neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are past away. I find it interesting as we go further that in Deuteronomy 30 verse 9 We are told that, and the Lord thy God shall make thee plenteous in every work of thine hand, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of, the li of thy land, for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over thee for good, as he has rejoiced over thy fathers. Isaiah 62, 5. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. Along with Isaiah 65, 19. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall no more, shall be no more heard in her for the voice of crying. Jeremiah completes this. Yea, I will rejoice over them that do good. And I will plant them in this land assuredly with my whole heart and with my whole soul. If you differ with your brethren as to the understanding of the grace of Christ and the operations of his spirit, you should not make these differences prominent. You view the matter from one point, another just as devoted to God views the same question from another point and speaks of the things that make the deepest impression on his mind. Another viewing it from still a still different point presents another phase and how foolish it is to get into contention over these things when there is really nothing to contend about. Let God work on the mind and impress the heart. In this conversation that I had this last week, I find it very interesting that within even the more considered conservative churches. There is great differences of opinion. One of those differences of opinion has now become whether we are to accept the understanding of the Godhead or if we are to accept the understanding of the Trinity. Our adversary works very much through the darkness. There are those that would accept the teaching of the Trinity as if it were something found within Scripture. There have been times that Mrs. White was told that some items were not to become a point of contention. We have at this time a teaching also, whether we accept the daily to be paganism or whether we accept the daily to be that of Christ's ministry in the most holy place. We need to understand these things. We will be confronted with all of these teachings and we need to be able to give a clear answer for the faith that is within us.
The Lord is constantly at work to open the understanding, to quicken the perceptions that men may have a right sense of sin and of the far-reaching claims of God's law. The unconverted man thinks of God as unloving, as severe, and even revengeful. His presence is thought to be a constant restraint. His character and expression of thou shalt not. His service is regarded as full of gloom and hard requirements. But when Jesus is seen upon the cross as the gift of God because he loved men, the eyes are open to the things in a new light. God, as revealed in Christ, is not a severe judge or an avenging tyrant, but a merciful and loving father. As we see Jesus dying upon the cross to save lost man, the heart echoes the words of John. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. 1 John 3, 1. There is nothing that more decidedly distinguishes the Christian from the worldly man than the estimate he has of God. How do we see God today? How do we accept him? Is this a father that can be trusted with our innermost thoughts, our innermost desires, our innermost questions? Or is this someone that we need to be afraid of? Some workers in the cause of God have been too ready to hurl denunciations against the sinner. The grace and love of the father in giving his son to die for the sinful race has been put in the background. The teacher needs the grace of Christ upon his own soul. In order to make known to the sinner what God really is, a father waiting and yearning to love, to receive the returning prodigal not hurling them at not hurling at him accusations and wrath but preparing a festival of joy to welcome his return here she gives reference back to zephaniah 3 14 to 17 Oh, that we might all learn the way of the Lord in winning souls to Christ. We should learn and teach the precious lessons in the light that shineth from the sacrifice upon the cross of Calvary. There is but one way that leads from ruin and continuously ascends. Faith, all the time reaching beyond the darkness into the light until it rests upon the throne of God. All who have learned this lesson have accepted the light which has come to their understanding. To them, this upward way is not a dark, uncertain passage. It is not the way of finite minds, not a path cut out by human device, a path in which toll is exacted of every traveler. Now is the time that we may prove whether we will obey the law of God or whether we will transgress. When a sinner unloads his burden at the foot of the cross, then it is that peace and happiness that comes to him. What do we call it when a sinner unloads his burden at the foot of the cross? Is this not justification?
And there is joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine who need no repentance. The Lord God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Is this not a great example of the shepherd searching for that lost sheep? All heaven appreciates the struggles of those who are fighting for the crown of everlasting life, that they may be partakers with Christ in the city of God, the very streets of which are pure gold, as it were transparent glass. Revelation 21, 21. God wants you there. Christ wants you there. The heavenly host wants you there. The angels are willing to stand in the outer circle and let those who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus stand in the inner circle. If God wants you there, if Christ wants you there, if the heavenly host wants you there, how can you turn them down? If Christ's offer of his righteousness to clothe you for that great feast to prepare you for what is coming is accepted then there is great joy in heaven but if his righteousness is turned away because we have accepted the righteousness of man because we have accepted the salvation of the church and not of Christ This is not a reason for heaven to be joyful. What, do we, what else do we see here, brothers and sisters? What is there that is being presented before us? How do you see this? Well, I see it as my hope is only in Christ. It's very, very simple. And regarding laying your burdens down at the foot of the cross, we need to do that daily. And I keep having to relearn that. And many afflictions come upon me when I forget that. You know, the other aspect of what what came to my mind as you're reading that was those that I have spoken to who just don't see the relevance to what you're saying, what the what Mrs. White was saying, what the Bible tells them. They just don't see the relevance. And you know, if you don't see there's any value or relevance in it, what what can you what can we do? I mean, we just help them try to see. This is the opportunity of a lifetime. Is it not the opportunity of eternity? It certainly is. At this time, Can we not see that we are being given a choice? That this choice for us is a choice that we may either choose what Christ is offering or we are choosing that of the adversary. Will the adversary walk again 
in the courts of heaven. Uh, I don't see that anywhere in the Bible. Right. Uh, or in the spirit of prophecy. I was reading an A.T. Jones, though, and it startled me because I hadn't really thought about this before, that at the when the heavenly city has descended on the earth and Satan marshals his agents to encompass it, and then fire comes out of, out of heaven and destroys them all. I'm thinking, he can't enter heaven anymore, but he's actually going to be permitted, along with his demonic agents, to occupy the redeemed earth for a, for a very short time. And that really startled me when I started thinking about that. Jones has some very interesting points. Especially as we've been going through his 1893 general conference sessions. It's not hard for us to realize that here he was alone presenting these items before the leadership because Mrs. White had been sent to Australia. As she said, God was not in this. Wagner was in Europe. We need to recognize as we are going through this that there will be times that we will be standing and believing that we are standing alone. Yet, we are not alone. Because God, through his spirit, through these studies that are being done, will bring these things to mind where we must be able to give the reason for the, for the hope that is within us, that we will have to give an answer for our faith. Do you realize your value in the sight of God? He says, ye are laborers together with me. Here we need to see 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9. Are you letting your light shine in clear rays to a fallen world? Are you seeking to exercise every faculty and every power which God has given you? You may not be a minister, but you can be a witness. You may not be an eloquent speaker, but you can be eloquent in living Christ. You can be eloquent in letting your light shine before men. You will have to travel a rough path. You will have to meet the powers of darkness, but you do not meet them alone, for God has given you a general. How are we to be a witness? This question was posed to me many years ago. We cannot be a witness unless we have seen or experienced that which we testify about. Can we offer a witness for that which we have not seen or that we have not experienced? Not a witness, we can. 
Can we offer testimony for that which we do not know? And if we do offer testimony of that which we do not know, then what are we doing? No language can express the love of Jesus Christ for the human soul. Leaving his home on high, he came to seek the lost sheep. And there was joy in heaven when he returned, saying, I have found the sheep that was lost. Luke 15, 6. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Again, Je Zephaniah 3, 17. Let not your hearts be troubled. Jesus has not forgotten you. He is preparing mansions in the kingdom of glory for everyone who will believe on his name. Whosoever cometh to me, he says, I will in no wise cast out. John 6, 37. Do not lose eternity out of your reckoning. Are you prepared for that life which measures with the life of God? Are you prepared to see the king in his beauty and cast your golden crowns at his feet? Yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Hebrews 10, 37. In this beautiful parabolic prophecy of Zechariah, the high priest Joshua, standing clothed in filthy garments before the angel of the Lord, represents the sinner. And the word is spoken by the Lord, take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. Then was given the promise of restoration to the father's house. If thou wilt walk in my ways, I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by even among the angels that surround the throne of God. Here we are to see Zechariah 3, verses 4, 5, and 7. Who is being shown here as the high priest of Joshua, the sinner? But what sinner are we talking about? Are we not talking about ourselves? Are we not talking about those that would represent Christ to this world at the very end? As the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. He will save he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Isaiah 62, 5. And again, Zephaniah 3, 17. And heaven and earth shall unite in the Father's song of rejoicing. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Luke 15, 24. Here she is combining the prophecies of Isaiah, Zephaniah, with the parable of Luke 15. How much more clear can this be for us today? How much more direct can God be through these various people and these various sources to show just how much he values us.
we are today presented with a choice. It is a promise and a choice that is freely offered. Yet many will choose to reject it because they do not value the free gift of God, the righteousness that can come only through faith in Christ. What was it that the Savior said that is so direct with what we have been studying these last many weeks? If ye love me, how does the verse complete? My commandment. We have many that are willing to proclaim that they love Christ. They may be unsure of God the Father, but they are willing to say that they love Christ. If they love Christ, they should also love the Father. For I and the Father are one. Did not Christ state that? He did. Okay. He said he came to do the work of the Father. Now, if ye love me, keep my commandments. This is an admonition given to the world. It's choice A or choice B. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Not just selected ones, but you will keep my commandments. If you don't love me, then you will pick and choose what commandments are to be kept. But if you choose not to keep them all, are you not then guilty of all? Is that not what Christ himself has said? For how can you love me if you will not keep my commandments? Oh, how many would be used by the Spirit if they would only yield themselves to him who gave his precious life to ransom them from the slavery of sin. Could those of good impulses who at times are deeply moved, determined to be holy on the Lord's side, how their friends and relatives would rejoice. There is triumph and rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. The highest joy and gladness is expressed by the angel when one soul receives Jesus Christ. That one soul causes gladness in the heavenly universe. The Lord thy God is in the midst of thee, writes Zephaniah, is mighty, and he will save. He will rejoice over thee with rejoicing. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing, Zephaniah 3.17. What a representation this is. What then must we do to please the Lord Jesus Christ, whose we are by creation and by redemption? We are the purchased possession of Jesus Christ, and we please him most by having implicit trust in his word. Let that sink in for a moment. How are we to please Christ? 
What does this mean to us? We please him most by having implicit, complete, total, unwavering trust in his word. Is this to be having trust in the New Testament only? Is this to be trust in the Psalms? only? Is this to be trust in the Pentateuch only? Are we not to trust in all of his word, including the prophecies? It doesn't qualify him. It just says his word, which would mean all, right? Correct. We are given an example from the 1919 Bible Conference of W.W. W. Prescott, who made it very clear that he hoped to never again have to give any kind of discussion or sermon upon the subject of Daniel 8, 13, and 14. He wished not to have to give a sermon on the 2300 days. Yet what are we told at the end of Daniel 8? That this vision of the evening morning is true. If something is true, are we not to hold on to it? If something is true, are we not to believe in it? It will not do for anyone who is striving for eternal life to float away with the worldly current. The Lord Jesus will be best pleased to see those who claim to love him relying individually upon divine influence and striving, loving, working by faith. Then we are laborers together with God, 1 Corinthians 3.9. Everyone striving after eternal life is to strenuously search out the truth for himself. He is to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We are laborers together with God. If every worker is to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, does this not also include the prophecies? Consider that today in, the, in this as we have been addressing these items. I know, but as few others could know, what that day meant when you decided to take your stand under the bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel. There was joy among the heavenly angels. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty, and he will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Zephaniah 3.17 Many times, Mrs. White repeated this, many times throughout all of these different letters, these different manuscripts, she was very direct in pointing us to this with Zephaniah. My heart was, a, was made to rejoice, and I pray that you may not allow prejudice to close your mind against the message of truth, which God has sent to his people. The work in which I am engaged is not my work. It is the work God has given me to do. 
I am seeking to lift up Jesus to direct the people to God's word. And I ask you to make that word your guide continually. Is that word to be our guide today alone? What is she saying here? Are we not to make this word our guide day by day? Understanding the trials through which you have passed, my heart is very tender toward you. Cling to Jesus, I beseech you, for he gave his precious life for you. All the trials you shall endure here for the truth's sake, for Christ's sake, will work for you a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While you look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. Second Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. We are standing upon the verge of eternity. In that great day when the judgment shall sit and the book shall be opened, everyone shall be judged according to the deeds done in the body. Better, my sister, bear the cross in this world following in this self-denying path our Savior trod, than to have every wish gratified here and lose heaven and lose eternal life. We are presented with trials. We are presented with difficulties. Yet are we not told that we are to praise God in all things? How many of us do that? How many times when we are given a trial, a burden to bear, a problem that's before us, how often do we praise God in all things? Disappointments you will have, but ever bear in mind that Jesus, the living risen Savior, is your Redeemer, your Restorer. He loves you, and it is better to share his love than to sit with princes and be separated from him. To be ranked with those whose gold cannot be counted, and yet to be poor in the estimate of God and the heavenly angels would be eternal loss. In the converted soul, the love of God supersedes the love of the world. The life of faith is a life of peace and rest and joy in the Holy Spirit. What else do we see here? What else can we take from this passage? I mean, we can certainly see it's an individual matter. It's not something we um, we get because we go to church. Amen. Salvation is indeed an individual matter. Salvation is one finding the hope the salvation within Christ. It is not finding this within a church or within a group.
Light, precious light, is shining forth from the cross of Calvary. This is our illustration. This is our central light. Look at the cross and accept Jesus Christ by living faith as our righteousness, and power will be with you, for you will prevail with God as did Jacob. What are we being promised here? What is being shown here? We need to accept Christ by living faith as our righteousness. Is Jacob not a great example of righteousness by faith? As was his grandfather Abraham. There's much we can learn from him. Yes. Work for the salvation of souls as though you knew thy, by sight that you were in full view of the whole universe of heaven. Every angel in glory is interested in the work being done for the salvation of souls. We are not awake as we should be. All the angelic hosts are our helpers. The Lord thy God is in the midst of thee. Think of that. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. Consider that carefully. He will save. What a promise. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Oh, cannot we then work with courage and faith? In that day, it will be said to Jerusalem, Fear thee not, and to Zion, let not thine hands be slack. Only have faith, pray and believe, and you shall see the salvation of God. As we have been studying, I think that it is clear now that we need to have living faith in Jesus Christ, our righteousness. That if we do not have this living faith, that we will not have his power. You cannot have one without the other. Is there a problem with this statement? Is there a question that can be risen from this statement? Yeah, the problem is our human nature. Yes. When this message was initially presented, beginning in 1886 and then in 1888, how many were there in 1888 that understood the messages of righteousness by faith. There were a hundred people attending that general conference session. How many fully understood the message of righteousness by faith? Well, we'd have to presume from Sister White's statements that there was relatively few. 
That is a good presumption, yes. Can you put a number to it? Not me. Was it three? It was three. <laughs> you mean the people presenting it? <laughs> That's all that understood it. That means that only Mrs. White, Ellett Wagner, and Alonzo Jones were the only ones to totally grasp the fact that we needed living faith in Jesus in order to receive his power. So was there some sort of statement that would make you make that statement? I mean, as far as the, you know, three, was there some, was there something that uh, Ellen White or somebody had said, Jones or Wagner had said, I believe it's Sister White who made the statement that only those that had presented had understood what this was in total, that the message itself was only understood by them, that the rest, the 97%, the leadership of the church, the great ministers of that day, the great speakers of that day, the evangelists of that day did not understand the message of righteousness by faith. Her heart was glad because she had stated that the only time that she had heard this message previously was in conversations between herself and her husband, between herself and James. And of course, James had been gone for almost eight years at that time. Is it a message that is hard to understand? No. Is it a message that requires strength of character to accept? Yes. Yeah, that last piece there. In and with this study, in this so-called minor prophet, we are seeing identified for us by Mrs. White the need that we have to accept the righteousness of Christ by faith. That when we are unified in accepting the righteousness of Christ by faith, that his power will be with us and we will prevail with God as did Jacob. It is this thought that I seek to leave with you today. There is much more that she has stated, much more that we will yet address. But our time today is at a close. Any other thoughts or any other comments that you would like to bring today? Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, there is much that we yet need to understand. 
from the words that Mrs. White had given us and left for us. We know that we need to have living faith. A faith that brings us into a closer relationship with you, with your spirit, and with Christ. Help us today. May we consider these admonitions and these promises. Direct us now so that we may more fully and completely understand the task that is yet before us, so that our characters may be right, and so that we may be prepared for the power that you wish to give. Direct us now. Please bless us this day. In all things, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.